now open the Estacada City Council workshop on the marijuana dispensary code development. And uh, we have Peter Watts here, which is our attorney, going to help us navigate through this. Uh, Melanie, did you want to put forth the plan? Or? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Um, tonight, so in back in November, the council discussed, met and discussed, in a, I think it was in a separate workshop, about um, what the response from the community was. We got quite a lot of feedback from the online survey and the paper survey, and Denise had put that all um, in kind of a summary format. And so we talked about that. I included the minutes from that workshop in the packet because just to jog our memory, and it seemed like you wanted to, um, as there was kind of consensus to um, reduce our regulations to come closer to the state, but maybe not go all the way um, to what the state allows, but to keep some kind of local control there. And so Peter is here with us tonight, our city attorney, and he has a lot of experience in this. Um, thank, thankfully for us, not maybe not for him, but, um, and so he is here to, I think, hear what your priorities are. What are we trying to accomplish with this? What, do, what kind of things, what are we wanting to provide to the community and why are we wanting to do this? And then um, Peter's gonna help us draft the ordinance that will um, decide, you know, that will explain what the, what the dispensary regulations in Estacada are. So I'm pretty much gonna let Peter take it away. He has a lot of great ideas and information I think that he can share with you. So um, that's where we're at. Did you, did it miss anything? No, I'm, I'm, the good news is every, all my other clients have paid me to learn all this stuff. So you, you guys don't <laughs> have to. So you're kind of getting the benefit of six years or seven years of um, experience with this issue. Just by way of background, I've represented governments as small as the Harney County Soil and Water Conservation District and as large as Clark County, Washington. Um, and everybody in between. And one of the things that I've learned is that the vision and values of every community are a little bit different. And it's, it's you guys who are kind of charged with um, understanding those vision and values. And so anything like this, and this is a, this is a issue that's been controversial, some places I represented, not controversial in others, um, whatever the regulations are, um, what's most important is, is they represent kind of the value values of the place and, and that they're things that, that you feel good at about. And then we can craft regulations that kind of meet all those objectives. Um, my first experience um, trying to draft something on the recreational side, because, you know, there was the medicinal side previously, um, was because... Uh, a legislator who was kind of um, co-chair of the Joint Committee on, on Marijuana and Leininger had reached out to me with some kind of city regulatory things of like, what do you think can work and what can't? And the problem um, at that point is we just didn't have any data points. I mean, Washington had been legal for two years, but it hadn't been implemented for two years, Colorado around the same thing. So a lot of what we did were kind of guesses, knowing that um, from the state organ administrative rules, there would be an opportunity to come back once those data points were kind of um, more clear to revise and craft. And then um, Representative Leininger became Judge Leininger and is now at the Clackamas County Circuit Court, so we never kind of did that revisit. But uh, this past summer, I was asked by some other people, including Matt Miletus, who is an OLCC board member and the one that's kind of been tasked with cannabis is what it's called now, I guess, um, with that. And, and he asked me if I would kind of look through and look at hit what worked and what hadn't and what we'd gotten right and what we hadn't. And he had some, he had some strong thoughts, but kind of wanted me to do that independently. And, and I told him I, I would. One of the things I didn't understand at the time was that between the Oregon Revenue Code 162 and what's called IRS Section 280E um, is that people that sell cannabis in stores cannot deduct any of their ordinary necessary business expenses. So they're able to deduct the cost of the goods sold. So what they pay the um, 
what they what they purchase the the cannabis for, but as far as their rent, their employee costs, even their electricity, any of those things, none of that's deductible. So it almost looks like a um, a um, an income tax on your net versus gross. Then the other thing is that there's essentially a 20% sales tax statewide. So there, there's a 17% that this state um, gets that traditionally has been given back to the cities, but now is being set aside for rehabilitation as a result of, I think it was, uh, um, well, it was, it was the uh, initiative that decriminalized possession of certain amounts of drugs and then wanted to create opportunities for rehabilitation. So the, the funds that normally would have flowed to cities under that um, no longer do. Uh, different cities that I represented took very different approaches and none of us knew what, what would kind of work the best. Uh, Dundee really only wanted one dispensary for the city and that ended up being Chalice. Uh, and that is outside of Ontario, my understanding, one of the most lucrative um, places in Oregon just because uh, the surrounding cities don't have, it's not legal. And, and their code was written essentially so there would only be one in the city. And so uh, if you look at like city of Portland versus the city of Beaverton, Beaverton limited based on population, Portland really opened it up. The, the end result has been, I think, on a per capita basis, what I've seen is that having less stores ends up generating higher taxes for the city because if there are a lot of stores, and that's the case in some cities I represent, including Scapoos, the way that they compete then is on price. So if you've, if you've driven through a place and you see like advertisements for $1 pre-rolls, that's essentially because the amount of competition has made it so, um, so, so that in order to get the customers, it's, it's a lower price, which then kind of results in lower profitability for the stores, lower tax for, um, for the cities as well as the state. The, the other thing that, that came as a bit of a surprise is that, um, I think a lot of stores didn't understand that they couldn't deduct some of these expenses. And so when the state has gone into audit, um, there are very few that necessarily have come out of an audit without a lot of substantial um, kind of revisions and, and owed money. And, and if you look at the testimony of people that have kind of critiqued our system in Oregon and our tax system in Oregon, that's what they'll say is that you know, they owe hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes because um, a it's really, unless you control all elements of the supply chain, it is very hard to be profitable in, in cannabis, particularly with the illegal grows in Southern Oregon that where they'll rent land for hemp, it won't be hemp that they're growing and then it's like black market, uh, which drives down the price of the people that are trying to do it right. So it is a really challenging atmosphere. Um, I had thought maybe that this session that they would revisit some of the regulations uh, and revise them. And I think that the consensus was there just wasn't enough time in the short set, uh, session for people to really understand the issues and to fix some of these problems. At the same time, um, the federal government's looking at this, actually had a conversation last week with Tim Leahy, who works for Ron Wyden, and Ron Wyden and, and uh, Senator Schumer are two of the people that are kind of leading those federal efforts. And we don't know exactly what that will look like. They're doing their due diligence at this time, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't, and whether to do something that looks more like an alcohol distribution, where you would have people, you would have the three points that aren't necessarily in it integrated. So you'd have the people that are growing it, you'd have the people that are distributing it, and you would have the people that are selling it. And you wouldn't have someone that was um, integrated into all three, whether it's going to look like that or whether it's going to look um, something more like a craft 
brewery where they're making it on site and they're selling it on site and they're also selling it through distribution channels. So there's a lot we know, a lot we don't know. Um, my advice to staff, because I was like, well, I don't know what the right answer for SDK is because every city is different. And they're like, well, what well, if you were to do it, what would you do? And so what I, my view is that there are benefits and burdens associated with anything, including this definite benefits and burdens. And um, it is always easier to provide more regulation and more structure up front and then loosen that over time based as the community gets kind of used to something and becomes more familiar with the benefits and the burdens because that tends to take a lot of fear out of it. So what I, given what I've learned in Dundee and King City and in a bunch of other places, as well as looking at the state program, what I suggested is that um, we could make it not an outright use, but a conditional use in multiple zones, not in a um, not in a single family residential zone, but but in the downtown business zone. Um, my recommendation would be that we start it small. So like a, we could tie it to um, the number of OLCC liquor stores or one, whichever's less or um, whichever's more. And, and the reason that I came up with that is there may be an initiative in November that would make it so that uh, uh, hard alcohol is sold in stores instead of in the OLCC liquor stores. And, and if that's the case, there might not be any more. And then we would still want to make sure that there was at least one. Understanding that um, we can always expand it. But if you, we start with a approach that well, I saw in Scott Foods, they ended up with five or six. And then once you have, if you later then make something less regulated, the ones that are in existent are uh, um, pre-existing non-conforming use. So it's just a lot easier to start small and to expand it out over time if that works. And then that also makes it so that people are able to better charge maybe something that allows them to make a profit um, versus having to compete just strictly on price, which kind of in some respects seems like a race, race to the bottom. So if, if I were to, you know, be, if, if I were to draft it based on kind of my own experience, those are the kind of things that, that I would be looking at. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, before you get too far, I want to just ask, is it allowed to have uh, marijuana retailing as an outright use while also at the same time limiting how many are present? Is that a, a allowable to have an outright use while still limiting the number? Yeah, we certainly could do that. The reason that the reason I'd suggest it as a conditional use is because making a conditional use a lot would allow you to one of my other ideas would would be to say, okay, we're we're going to make we're going to have this as a conditional use and ask for proposals. So we would want a proposal of you know there could be and there could be clear and objective criteria about which proposal to pick, um, and maybe people wouldn't want signage like neon signage or something like that. And so the proposals could reflect all those things. And it's possible then that you could look at these proposals and, and what they wanted to do and, and where they were interested in putting it and say, none of these feel quite right. And so we're just not going to, at this point, we're going to pull back. And it's possible that community could look at the proposals too and say, you know, we, we have some ideas, but this isn't it. If we make it an outright allowable use, then it really is whoever gets their application in the in the door first versus maybe the application that's the best fit for the community. And we could build criteria in including you, you know, if someone had previously done business in the community or adjacent, that might be worth 10 points. Um, we could do, you know, the number of total licenses they owned because what one of the other things we've seen is that some of the larger companies haven't had the same tax issues. 
um, as some of the smaller ones. So those are sort of criteria that we could build and then you guys could review in order to make it so it's the highest scoring versus just first in the door. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I have is obviously one of the, the biggest contentions has been about having this in our downtown main core area. So having it under conditional use, or is there any way to have restrictions on that? So while it may be a few blocks off or somewhere else, we can't have it in our downtown, like main streets and things like that. Is that something we can write into the code or would that be? Yeah, that's what I did for Dundee. Um, you know, Dundee has a, like you guys, it has a compact downtown. Uh, and what we said is that it couldn't be within a certain number of yards of the school. And there were some other things we put in there. And so it kind of prescribed the location and it put the location kind of where they wanted it. Um, and it, that worked out really well. So we can get really creative with the code. The key is the conditional use because that gives us kind of the ultimate discretion of then if something comes in, you guys are like, wait a second. You know, we thought we had this dialed in and, and this isn't what we wanted to say no versus outright use. You know, we're stuck if they meet this, if somebody meets the standards. Is there an appeals process for someone meeting certain criteria with the conditional use and it's still not being approved? Um, can they appeal that decision? They could appeal a planning decision to the city council. Okay. Um, at this, we'd probably be doing it at a staff level and making a recommendation. And again, the idea is to maximize the good um, and to limit the kind of more problematic things. You've probably seen articles. It's mainly the city of Portland, but there have been some armed, kind of some violent armed robberies that have occurred. And I do not anticipate that being a problem here at all. I also think, you know, based on what I've learned that you guys would get good tax revenue here because it's adjacent to the Mount Hood National Forest. It's adjacent to campsites. Sandy doesn't have one, as far as I know. Um, there are other areas nearby that don't have one. And, and much like Dundee, there isn't a lot in proximity. Um, that's true here, too. I mean, same thing with King City. King City, it's legal. Lake as we go Westland, Twelfth, and it's not. So that store gets a lot of traffic, a lot of revenue. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just to clarify, you keep we keep hearing about this tax revenue that comes out. We're capped at 3%, correct? So on a $500,000 a year annual uh, net revenue, that would probably put us at what, $15,000 a year in, in tax revenue off of that? Yeah, and in the overall scheme of things, that's, that's, that's definitely not that much. And so uh, we keep talking about that, but I want to make that clear to everyone who's watching this, that 3% in the tax revenue does not make a big impact on their overall budget. So I think the biggest things we should be focusing on is, is community satisfaction. So I think that's going to be the biggest impacting piece here. So the communities that I've seen have generated hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I mean, I was stunned. It, it, um, I mean, everybody talks about Ontario, which is really a statistical outlier because it's both the only one on the Idaho border, um, the only city in Malheur County where it's legal, and they did a hundred million. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that three to five million is is outside of the um, possibility for for you guys. I mean, I again, I one of the many things that I was wrong about was um, how demand and profitability. That's another reason that it's really important to have a responsible owner because in a cash business, it's very hard to track. And so, um, you know, something to be careful. It's surprisingly lucrative. All right, so more questions. How's the time down? Have you noticed anything, <coughs> sorry. Have you noticed anything obvious from the how they've these cities have um, spent their revenue, if you will. Like, have you seen major improvements in schools or you know, not? In you know, they they make they generate all this revenue, and I always hear about 
oh, but the schools. And I look at Portland and I'm like, show me where that's improving Portland schools. A lot of cities have dedicated it to like health and public safety. And so it's been, it depends. Um, some of them, it just goes into the general revenue. Um, it's kind of however you want to use it. I am not aware of it being used for schools. Portland had, if you look at Portland's ordinance, they had it to like a certain amount supposed to be used for disadvantaged communities and that goes to Prosper Portland to be allocated and then there's a certain amount for health and I can't remember where that goes. Um, but I, the way, I've, in my opinion, the way I've seen it where it's been most effective is where people have kind of set it aside and used it as a match for grants. So for something like a tourism grant, you know, Travel Oregon might want a 10% match or Oregon's Mount Hood territory might be a match. And if you have just some funds where you can say like, here's that million dollar Travel Oregon grant, we can get our $100,000 without interrupting all the other city functions, without having to decide, does this go to, you know, Main Street projects, or does this go to um, the grant match? So that that's so communities have used it that way. I think they've managed to leverage their dollars quite a bit. So yeah, that, and that goes right along with the question I was going to ask. So we could use this money, the you know, if if it turns out to be a larger sum than the fifteen thousand dollars, you know, if it turns out to be. A large sum. We could use this money, like to for our URA grants. Is that would that be? The URA grants are usually the the amounts that are. I mean, URA grants are kind of like gas tax. They're yeah. it's for prescribed uses, and it's usually just those funds that are in that um, urban renewal district. But you could you could do the same type of grants with this as that. I mean, you could say. You, we can, the URA can provide this. And by the way, we have this other grant program where you could apply for that would be this. And, and then if uh, say a developer wanted to come in and do a multifamily, you know, multifamily residence, could we use that money, you know, to, you know, uh, a grant towards, you know, helping them get that going, helping them get that established? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could certainly do that. Um, and then the last part is, uh, could that money go towards, which I think I've already got the answer. Could that money go towards our, like our wastewater treatment plant that is going to cost us millions and millions of dollars? <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, I, I've seen different communities use it for all sorts of, of things. So unless, unless you guys yourselves decided to restrict it, um, you have maximum funds. Backing up here a minute, you mentioned conditional use versus I believe Councilor Gunsmith was stating outright use. What's what's the difference? Is conditional use we just set up some prescribed stipulations then? So when you have an outright use, then if if they meet the criteria, you have to grant it. You have no flexibility. And and you know that can be really good because we want people to have clear and objective criteria and know that if they do X, they get Y. With a conditional use, the downside is less certainty to the person making the proposal is the upside is more flexibility to the jurisdiction in order to decide whether they want it or not. And so usually where you'll see it, like the city of Milwaukee, you could get a fifth floor for a downtown apartment building if, and they, they decided for compelling architecture. Now that's pretty hard to know whether something's compelling because, but. Those are the sort of things where you can say, so if, if it's not something you want, you can say no, I think is, is the good thing about having a conditional use. Uh, the bad news is less certainty for the person applying. Um, you compared as close to Dundee, I think earlier. So with that, um, the story you helped them get in Dundee and the setup there, what kind of a tax revenue were they bringing in from that so we can get a better idea? I'm just trying to get an idea of what we're going to bring in here so we get a reality check. Uh, I think the last 
that I heard, I, I think they were between three and 500,000. Um, and I don't know if that was, I don't know if that included some money from the state coming back, but they have a relatively small population. The reason I compared you to them is because the area around them, there's not a lot of places where it's legal. So for a store here, what I would anticipate would be, there would be some locals that would be purchasing here. There would probably be some people coming in from Sandy. Um, and then there'd be people that were going camping or in the Mount Hood National Forest. You know, the same people that buy gas here would my, maybe would buy there too. Um, I just wanted to clarify, one of the reasons I was asking about outright use versus conditional use is because, um, well, we all just met with the consultants of our uh, housing needs analysis, and one of the recommendations that they've been making is that if you have multifamily units be an outright use versus a conditional use, um, like, you know, duplexes or triplexes as an outright use, you're more likely going to actually see that type of development because you don't have an additional barrier for those developers to go through. So when we talk about something being a conditional use, we're talking about an additional barrier. And of course, one of the things that we have been learning about as a council over the last year, having this discussion about cannabis regulation, is that there's already several barriers that exist for cannabis, uh, for, for cannabis retailers to come in. Uh, whether it be the fact that it's not zoned for it or um, the fact that the property has a federal loan out on it. You know, we talked about that being a barrier that a property has to be owned outright with no federal loans on it in order for someone to actually open a store in that location. Um, so when, when I was asking about the differences between an outright use and a conditional use, I'm just talking about that being an additional barrier for anybody to experience and whether or not we could remove that as a barrier or whether or not that's a necessary barrier for our city. Um, I just really wanted to clarify that because, again, barriers are what we're talking about today, and um, and we just need to know which barriers we we as a city are willing to remove. Um, yeah, and I see Councilor Dunsmuir's point as far as barriers, but I think as having a conditional use allows us as a city because to help quell some of the fear that that people have here with. Is it going to be we going to be overrun with it? Is it going to be a bunch of people that's going to come in and you know bring up what kind of problems is that going to cause for the city? Where is it going to go? That at least allows the city to possibly open it up to the public, have them come in and speak on it, so that they can feel like they've addressed their fears, their concerns, at the same time as knowing that there is the ability to say no if someone does have something that doesn't that you know may be questionable or concerning to the rest of the community or to the council. We have the ability to say no to that. I think retaining that ability gives us that a chance to, like I said, quell some of that the over overly exert fear that they've had in the in the community about this. And it's I think it might be a good middle ground for us to consider. So going over the questionnaires that we had during our um, open house, the online survey, and then the paper survey. Um, in your experience in other in other cities, I mean, do they restrict it from you know so many yards from a church, from park, from sports fields? And I, obviously, there's going to be you know restriction from schools. I mean, that's a uh, the most the most common one is schools. Yeah, um, and because it's really easy to draw that line, so it's really easy to for people to understand, and a lot of people just don't want to have a conversation with a young child about, you know, what that business is. And so that's why some of the other things that we could, you guys could think about are things like signage. Because if you, there, you can go, I mean, so someone looking for, for cannabis can go online and see where all the stores are, you know, um, it, they don't. And so maybe a community might say, we don't want green neon you know, cannabis leave signs because we don't, our parents don't want to have that conversation with their kid. Um, you know, I think that there've been, there've been other, other criteria that have limited it just to make sure that's in certain zones. And, and I think that's perfectly fair too. And again, it's just um, to, to Joel's point, a lot of people are just really nervous about this and they wanna make sure that the fit is the right fit for the community. 
And so I think the more opportunities that certainly the, the, the jurisdictions I've represented have said, you know, we're not going to do what Portland did and just say, as long as there's not another store within 400 feet, you can do it. We're going to really take time and make sure that this is something that everybody understands and that we agree can be an amenity for the city versus a burden. Um, those have gone a lot more smoothly than if people think that it could just turn into kind of the wild west of cannabis yeah. and where, where jurisdictions haven't had those criteria, that makes people, I think, a lot more anxious in my mind. So with any, any barriers, we want to make sure that they were reasonable in approach and not going to unduly burden everything, but also that the community have a say in this and make sure that it was right size for them. And it's possible the community come out and say, we want like eight of these, you know, actually we want them competing on price. I think that's probably very unlikely, but I've been consistently surprised in different jurisdictions about what the reaction has been. So I've learned that you cannot necessarily predict. Well, because it's short amount. I mean, in a short amount of time, the perception has changed immensely. Even I would say the last five years, I've seen a move. So I can see where people come from that. Oh, um, I, I'm supportive of the conditional use idea as well, too. Um, it, with the outright use, we're trying to entice apartments to come in. Conditional use, we've got uh, folks coming to us asking if they could establish something in here. So the conditional use seems like it'd be a good fit for us right now. I'm, I'm in support of, of trying to craft something from that standpoint. So the, this is a workshop. So we're not just asking question of Peter. We're, we're talking amongst ourselves, correct? Okay. So um, I, I know Sean and, and Katie probably know from the beginning of this whole thing, I went from being a against this, you know, against having it to where I'm, I'm really, you know, through conversations that I've held with people and, um, you know, a local, a certain local business, a business owner, that's um, really enlightened me on, on, on a lot of this stuff. So um, I am completely for this being a conditional use application. I'm, I, I'm completely for that. I would like to, at the very least, remove the church um, stipulation, but I would like to reduce all the rest of them to the 500 feet, if that makes sense. Um, I don't like the, you know, the complete 1,000 feet from everything and never, ever getting one of these businesses into Estacada. So um, I don't see that. I think if we remove, if we remove the um, the church aspect, the leaving in the fact that it, that it's not going to be allowed in a residential zone is going to take care of the whole church aspect of it, because um, the the majority of our churches are in residential zones, except for the churches out, you know, the church out north on the highway, which I don't even think is in city limits. Um, so, um, you know, just I think it if we just remove the church aspect because uh, of the current not being allowed in a residential zone. Um, that'll, that'll make a lot of people in town happy because, um, but then reducing the others, I think that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now, you know, uh, conditional use, remove the church wording and then reduce to 500 feet. That's kind of where I'm leaning, but I am completely open to, you know, what anybody else is for. I just kind of want to get Get some. I want to get some movement on this. Get some, you know, get some de definitives from us. So, thank you, Mayor. Um, I could compromise down to what Jerry was discussing, as long as we could have some way of, of keeping them off the main street there, maybe yes. a block or two off that, our that main also. main and Broadway or something like that, so we can satisfy those concerns. I, I can understand removing the, the church one or something because they are mostly inside the neighborhoods and reducing some of the other ones down, but protecting the areas that everybody has been mainly concerned about, about those areas. I mean, I, I could find a way to compromise somewhere in the middle there, yeah. as long as we could write something in there that does that. 
with especially with the comp the conditional use because yeah. if they're trying to put in an area that maybe there is a hole we've opened and there's a massive community pushback on that or concern that allows us to say no to it and appease the majority of the community but if they find a good place that isn't you know causing a lot of problems people are good if it's for the business side of it, it gives us a chance to say yes so that's just my take on it I was just kind of curious, um, what is the benefit of not having it within a thousand, or I'm sorry, within uh, 500 feet of a park? If you want to reduce it down to 500, I guess I'm just asking. You know, I just, logic behind that with you. I, I really didn't, um, I really don't see there being an issue with it, with it, with the whole park aspect. Um, I just, the majority of the people that I've talked to about this, um, and I've had a lot of conversations since this, this is, you know, um, I think that open house, that open house was was huge for me as far as eye opening and just uh, g gaining knowledge just from a couple of conversations that I had during that open house. And, uh, um, I, you know, the majority of the people that I talked to, the parks don't come up. The parks don't come up as, as being an issue. But, um, and, you know, the parks, most of the parks in town, you know, in town are in that residential area. Go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm conversation, no, yeah. conversation. So one of the things that come to mind is that that bike plaza right there in front of city hall is considered a park and it is okay. in our parks master plan. So if we left Whoa. it at 500 feet and you couldn't have it within 500 feet of that spot right there, which would essentially kind of take away the purpose of opening it up to the downtown. Well, so uh, as what Joel was saying, you know, keeping it a couple of blocks off the main thoroughfare, that'll take care of that 500 feet right there like that so if we say if we say keep it keeping it a couple of blocks off the main thoroughfare be, being main and broadway um that's going to eat up that 500 feet and this park will not even be a, an issue you know you know I'd what i'm saying really curious the one the like. one park the one park that would be an issue i believe would be once the our uh riverfront park is opened up you know then that kind of that kind of eats up a lot of the a lot of the area over here including the strip mall where the Kaz is right correct. yeah yeah so that would be my one concern there the only park you know going through going through all the parks and you know in town that's the one park that really um is once that one is opened up that i think would be that would be the only park i think would have where there would be an issue i i guess um a question that i would then open up to the, i mean the entire council we're all having this discussion is so if you guys are comfortable with removing the church thing what if we did just remove the church and parks uh rule and we said you know open it up to the downtown but make sure that it is not adjacent within or adjacent to broadway and main street um or within a certain feet of broadway or main street i probably wouldn't do something as extreme as 500 feet just because um, 500 feet really does envelop a very large section of our downtown zone. Um, but uh, if, if we did it that way, would you guys be comfortable with removing the parks thing too? Or maybe even reducing it more than 500, you know, um, maybe reducing it to 250 instead? Uh, yeah, I have a compromise that might work for what you're looking for, because I think your main concern with the parks is this strip all over here, correct? Well, I mean, you've got a glass store in the Casadero part or the Casadero strip mall thing. So you could theoretically have a retail store in that strip mall. And if we have a park right over here, then it would essentially null and void that whole section. Yeah, I'm with, saying yeah. Though that's your concern. Yeah. Is it possible to write in the code with the 500 feet to the parks? Because there's areas, there's other areas that I'd want from the park because I don't want to take my daughter to a park and then there's a st store near it or something you know like if for example if it opens up a spot near let's just say uh, i don't know if it's within a school distance but up there across from like wade or something like that or future parks developed i don't want to you know have to explain that to her or you know other kids and things like that so i got that piece there but could we do an exception for a specific park or location that would allow everything else falls under there and have a, a documented exception to that park well i think basing it on the i, I thought that was uh, a yeah. long idea when we designated this whole bike plaza here as a park in the first place. So that that was just I should never have <laughs> anyway. It, um, it's the parks as they exist today. So um let's say you kept the 500 feet. My understanding is that's not yet a park. So if it became a park, then the location would be the pre-existing non-conforming use. So they could continue to to operate. 
if they'd opened up already. At that if they had opened up already. So again, it's it was what's called the goalpost rule. So it's it's as it exists at the time of the application. And that keeps it so they put in an application and then if you guys could designate a ton of stuff parks and it, it just wouldn't matter because they it's that that snapshot in time that matters. But if we leave it as a conditional use that's all very much up to uh, opinion essentially because I know that when if you go back and look at public record from January of 2017 the city council originally denied a marijuana retailing license because of the fact that they were planning a park in a specific spot and they didn't want a marijuana retail spot to be in that spot. Um, and so just even the plan of having a future park there was enough to deny the application back in 2017. Yeah, so again, I mean, we can craft this however, we can kind of craft this how, however you want it. I mean, if that's the location that you want it to be, we could even say that it's, you know, needs to be within X feet of City Hall, but not, I mean, we could, we could get very prescriptive. I, the problem with getting very prescriptive is that you know, then then it can create it so that the the owner of that building is then be like, well, I'm the only show in town. So if you want, so suddenly, you know, rent just went up um, <laughs> or, you know, so again, I, I think that there's some, there's something that we can come up with that is going to probably be palatable to most people and kind of crafting those regulations it's kind of be the journey to get there and then at that point my guess is there would be a lot of interest and you would probably get multiple proposals and you can kind of look at those and and figure out is there one um, that really works for us and and then it's possible that part of that process you could say actually we will, maybe we do want more than one so again it's always easy to more easy to broaden than to, to restrict so going along the lines of what you were just saying, and back to Councillor Litke's question just a minute ago, is it possible to draft an ordinance that says something along the lines of, you can't have it within 500 feet of a park unless it's at this specific tax lot, then we'll allow it? In let, I mean, unless it's within 100 feet of the Casadero or whatever. I mean, you could... Oh, okay. You can... You can and again, if... When you start getting that restrictive, it kind of to people can kind of look like you're picking winners and losers. And, and that can also have, uh, that can create some bad feelings or ill will. Um, so, but really it's risk as restrictive as you want it to be or not. My guess though, is that you'd probably want some options because particularly if you have competing um, proposals. I was just thinking uh, a lot of what we had talked about before, or I don't know if it was a general consensus or not, but but like uh, uh, Councilor Licky had said, it, the downtown area, okay, um, not on Broadway or Main Street, though. I mean, how 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 can we craft something that would that would state that? We could say it's allowed in the downtown zone, but not within a hundred feet of. Broadway or Maine. And you'd want to look at a map and say, okay, well, where, and that's what we did in that day, basically. Yeah. You know, I, we looked at a map and we were like, we didn't want it to be near the elementary school because kids walk to school. We wanted it to be on Highway 99 because we know people heading into wine country, if they were going to stop, they would stop there. There were already traffic issues. I mean, this was pre bypass, but we didn't want, a bunch of traffic going into off a of 99 um, and and we crafted it in that manner and the result is the chalice that exists there today. I want to talk to this council um, about the idea of instead of within feet of the idea of adjacent to and I'm and I, I say it like that because I see opportunity here and I see the future for us is increased tourism because we're opening up to 24 in May, which is really, really exciting. And that's gonna bring more traffic. And if we have a business like this, 
more than likely, we're going to have a lot of tourists stop in our downtown zone and get out of their car and walk around. And if we have them getting out of their car and going into a cannabis retailer and the, you know, the main street is 100 feet that way, they're less likely to then take their foot traffic that this business has just generated from in the downtown core, and they're less likely to then go and extend that tra or that foot traffic to other businesses who can benefit from that foot traffic as well. So for me, I totally see the advantages and the benefits of not having a storefront adjacent to Broadway or Maine. But if we keep those businesses so far away from Maine and Broadway, we're really losing the opportunity to capitalize on the foot traffic that this business is going to generate that I think our downtown businesses could really benefit from. The second thing is the security level of it. I mean, really, with this type of business, they're going to bring in a certain level of security. And I think that our downtown businesses, especially those closest to Broadway and closest to Maine, could probably benefit from the increased security that a business like this is going to bring to the downtown core. So, I mean, I wonder what everybody's openness level would be instead of saying within feet of, but kind of changing that to be not adjacent to or not, you know, no adjacent storefront, something like that. Because if you, like I said, if you reduce it or if you keep it 100 feet, you're losing the opportunity of foot traffic. Does that work? Basically? Yeah, I mean, we we can, again, we haven't got a lot of flexibility in this. The, the other thing, and, and this is anecdotal, um, but, you know, I've spent a lot of time on tourism issues as well. Anecdotally, people that are in the campsite or what have you come in and will buy cannabis and groceries and gas. And so it's more of a, it's not just people going out, it's the people that are there and then maybe nobody brought whatever or they got out there and realized they didn't have whatnot. And so they're going to go to a location that offers all of those things. So I think that, I mean, whether that would also involve like a meal in a restaurant, I, I don't know, but I think that people at least anecdotally want to do one stop and get everything they need. So I, I think it, you're right that it could positively impact other businesses. And, and I can see the argument you're making there, um, but I don't think 100 feet is going to make much of a difference because like the parking's there or it's downtown, but we have a store right here off of Broadway that's going to probably attract most of the people coming through here because they're going to want to get their supplies for camping and going up and get their treats and snacks and things. They're going to be stopping across the way and these get and goes and stuff like that as it is that we have this these same things the same attractions that she's referring to not on broadway as it is so if someone's coming through and they want to get beer and cigarettes they're going to go to the tackle shop or the get and go and they're not going to come down down to downtown anyway so that argument can be made either way for anything so i, I don't think that's one to pull the adjacent to and just to disregard the concern of the community for because the community has made it so concerned. Their, their biggest concern is protecting this downtown and this main street. That's one that they've been most concerned about. And by putting something in there, I think we're doing justice to the people of the community that have entrusted us to do so, but still allowing us to open up enough to have a cannabis shop come in. And that, that's what I'm saying. There's so many other options there. We're just basically making sure by doing the 100 feet of, uh, or whatever, I like the 100 feet, it's not that far. It opens up a lot of spaces on the back end over here in, in downtown. I think 100 feet is like that's like a block, right? Roughly, about a about a block. We we'll figure out what a block is. We can put that yeah. that amount in. The whole point is a block. Right. That I mean, that's that's a good compromise to what people have been concerned about. So, and it'll allow then the some the spots to open up to protect our main street, meet those meet those needs. The park thing meets the needs of everybody, bringing it down. The church thing. We have one church downtown. The rest are up, protected by schools and everything else, as you mentioned during the residential area i think that's our best best thing is reduced to 500 feet next the next a church thing and um keep like 100 feet or whatever the a block size is off of main and broadway and i think that's like the best middle ground for everybody on both sides to meet from what i can see so um, when I was talking about opportunity earlier, the other opportunity that I see is to help develop an area that has not been developed. Um, and what I'm speaking to is uh, the Riverfront Commercial, which is the new zone that we developed when we redid our comprehensive map. 
um, that is mostly right now the Forest Service building. And it's been sitting on the market for years and there's been no movement on it. And I think that there is an opportunity for somebody to do something really cool in there. And that it's gonna take people with money or people who think that they can earn money to come in and develop that spot. My question for this council is whether or not they see a value in opening up the riverfront commercial, that basically piece of property, um, to also allowing the possibility for this to come in and see some potential development in that area. I wouldn't hold your breath too much on what's happening and what there, there's some rumors flying around, but I wanna leave those to other things, so. Anybody else? I don't have a problem with allowing it in Riverfront Commercial. Okay. Can't express feelings one way or the other on that one. Yeah. As far as the Riverfront, no. Um, I'm just, you know, even though it was a small, comparatively, um, you know, if you put comparisons to the population of Estacada, I'm still looking at the dispensary placement results and I know it's a small percentage of people who did vote on this. We can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, you know, I'm just looking at what our constituency base has said. So I am for conditional use. Um, I'll agree. I will, I'll meet you on the church thing, but I really want to keep it away from the main Broadway and no neon signs. <laughs> so. Right now, staff, uh, at this point, what, what exactly are you looking for from us? I think, I think they've come up with, you've come up with what we're looking for. Um, do you need any more clarification? Pretty much what I have is we want to, we, we could drop the distance from churches. We could reduce the distance from parks and schools. I can't remember what the state regulation is on schools, but we'd have to. Yeah, and all those regulations were related to medical dispensaries. Originally. Oh, okay. That's what a lot of here. On. So, so we, we can, can do what we want with that. We can figure out how many feet a block is, and we can figure out where it would open it up and not, and just take a look at a map, and also maybe look at what properties are for rent or, or what's for sale to get an idea of mm -hmm. where it could actually be. Um, I think then we we'd want to we bring back um, an ordinance, you know, creating these amendments. We could then in the event that you do want to do a conditional use, et cetera, um, there could be a ton of interest or, or maybe not, but we could come up with some kind of objective criteria and, and a timeline so that uh, it would give people a chance to kind of um, demonstrate their commitment to the community and, and how they would do something that was kind of the right size. Right. I, I just want to throw this out there. Uh, last thing to throw out there. When I talk about developing areas that we would like to see development, but there is no development, what about the mill, mill area mixed use area? How does, how does the council feel about opening it up to that particular zone? A big purple blotch above downtown, and it's in between the downtown zone and basically runs behind all these, you know, residential neighborhoods and behind the library and behind Wade Creek Park and stuff all the way up to what is essentially the industrial park. I, I just want to get everybody's opinion or gauge people's comfort level on that. Joel, and then kind of wrap this up pretty quick so we have a few minutes. Thank you, Mary. Um, my, my thought is that that's either A, it borders right along a lot of housing areas, and my guess is one day it's going to be a bunch of housing. So kind of open that up. That's my, my restrict housing locations or we can put things if we don't allow it in residential and we open it up there, that may that may reduce the ability to have like, you know, uh, affordable housing or something like that one day or something else that could be going in there or another development or something along those lines. If we allow it in there, it might block that. So I think, I think we should tread cautiously in that one. So. Directive. I think we got a good idea of where we're going with this, Peter. We appreciate everything that you brought yeah. to the table. That keeps us in the in yeah. The right so order. we'll we'll work on the ordinance, and um, we'll be open to you know critique of that ordinance when it comes back to you. So hopefully, it's always nice to get it right the first time, it saves Maybe time and too. moves forward. But if the, in this case, you know, it might take a couple times to. And it, it, 
possible to set up another workshop so we can all discuss it when it comes back so that we're not you know blindsided by it right in front of us done. Well, I, I, I think it. that's a really prudent approach. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's nice to be able to have a conversation, you know, without the pressure of, of making a decision that night. And I mean, we're going to certainly try and make sure whatever we do reflects what we heard tonight. But, um, I, you know, I think that it's just making sure that, too, that the public know that you're really taking time with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Peter. I think I like also the fact that they are considering the conditional use where it's not going to be um, just like a, a race to see who can get their application in first, but somebody could really craft that and say what the benefit to the community would be and really kind of tell their story and say how, you know, how they expect it to be a benefit. Um, and then have that objective criteria. Because I know that's been a concern for staff. It's like, if we get like three or four applications all, all at the same time or one right after the next, you know, how do you make that fair and equitable to everybody? So um, I think that's a good choice. Well, it was a great discussion. I'm glad you all came to the table in that discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Jerry, you got some great stuff there. Joel, like Charity, y'all spoke up. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. Thank and you. I'm going to wrap this up. And we got about five minutes. Uh, 